But first of all, I just wanted to welcome everybody. I want to uh, also thank Donna and Shirley uh, for putting this event together. So thank you very much. I also want to thank Ace. I know you're, you're sort of spread around the room uh, for your partnership and helping us put this together. Uh, as Donna said, uh, Women at Willis is it's a new organization for us. This is going to be the first of many events uh, organizationally that, that we focus on, not only through Women at Willis, but uh, the whole concept of diversity. Uh, we've got a long way to go. I feel like within our own organization, we've been talking about this subject uh, for years, and I'm thrilled that we're finally making some progress on it. I do want to recognize Donna mentioned uh, Celia Brown. I'm not sure if Celia is. This was your vision many, many years ago, was to create an organization like this and actually do something. So I applaud you for making this a reality. So I want everybody, yeah. uh, I want everybody to enjoy the topic today. Use this event not only as the education uh, that we're going to hear from Judith, but networking. This is a great opportunity to spend time together to build relationships, uh, strengthen those that already exist. So very much appreciate you being here. Uh, and enjoy the session. So, Don, I'll turn it back over to you to introduce Judith. I'd just like to introduce Katie Kowarski today, and she has a few words, and then we'll get started with Judith. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Kowarski with ACE. I'm a global client executive uh, within the organization, and I'm also responsible for managing the overall Willis relationship for ACE in North America. Um, with, I also serve as the vice president of the ACE Women's Forum, and I, we have with me today Meg McSherry, who is the corporate account segment leader for the New York region, and she chairs the New York chapter of the ACE Women's Forum and was critical in putting this event together today. So on behalf of the women at Willis and the ACE Women's Forum, we are thrilled to be introducing Judith. I see we have our genders represented here very well, which makes me very happy. And I hope that what we talk about today will not just happen in this room, but it'll be something that can inspire you to think and talk about the subject of men and women in conversation starting today and then moving forward every day of your life. There's so much incredible work that's being done in this field right now about gender differences and gender similarities. And what I'm going to be doing is sharing some of those things with you. And if I get too scientific, somebody here has to promise to be my foil in the back and raise their hand uh, and let me know enough is enough because I get so excited about this field. I have studied it for so many years and I love to bring it down to earth so that all of you can better understand yourselves and understand how the, in, the things that we're learning about neuroscience can help you become a better leader. Um, I'm going to make this interactive, so we'll stop at different times, and I'm going to ask you what's on your mind about the subject that I'm telling you about. And I'm going to start with two stories. So I want you to listen to me to connect. So that's different than listening to reject. Very often we've learned to listen so that we can hear what somebody's saying and then reject it so that we can get our idea in. How many of you have ever done that in any time in your life? Now, I'd like to see the hands that are not being raised, and I'd like you to explain to me how that is possible, that that could not be a part of your life. Right? <laughs> We're trained to be smart, right? We're trained and rewarded to be great. And so when we're interacting with people frequently, what happens is that desire to be right or addicted to be right it comes out of us, whether we're a man or a woman. And so we start to navigate with people in a way that often cuts the conversation down to something less than what it could be. And so what I've been studying is how to open the conversation space for people to have bigger and better conversations together, whether you're a man or a woman. Does that make sense to you? And does that sound like something that you might be interested in learning how to do today? OK. I'm also going to ask you to bear your souls with each other. Have you ever heard that expression? Mm -hmm. huh? Do women know it better than men? Right, what is it? <laughs> Judith, I got a call at 4 I know, I just, there's not going to be enough time for it. Right, right. Um, we, what does bear your souls mean? Be honest. Be honest, right. One of the things we've learned, and I know that you're an honest person, I can tell already by the way you make eye contact and you know, smile and really want to stay and focus with me. Those are all important skills we're going to talk about as well. Um, but bearing your soul means that you're willing to talk to someone else about something that is something that you're working on that's important for you to get better. And whether you're a man or a woman, we've discovered that when people do that, it actually opens up a part of their brain, and that's the prefrontal cortex right up here. It's the youngest part of our brain. It's called the executive brain as well. And that when we're open and honest and transparent with people, that part of the brain gets warmed up by our heart. Now, I'm going to use the heart word a lot. I know men haven't been that comfortable historically with that word. But now we're learning that the heart is part of the connection to the brain that makes us all smarter, whether we're men and women. And we honor that. And we begin to notice how our heart beats when we're with people. 
and to make that beat more coherent, meaning that I feel like I'm connecting to you in a good way, then all of a sudden the brain opens up and we become really smart. So before I go further, is there anybody that needs to challenge that, uh, question that, uh, put a mark around that for me? I'm open, by the way. I'm setting a stage that I'm open to talk about anything in this room. Well, almost anything. <laughs> Make sense so far? Okay, let me, let me give you the two stories that I want you to listen to connect about, okay? One is how I came into this world of conversational intelligence, okay? And then the next is gonna be an interesting story about the genetics of men and women. And I want you to connect them together. And I also want you to turn next to a partner and share your thoughts about these two stories and how they connect, okay? So here's the first story, and this is where all of this began. I found out when I was very young that my father was a stutterer when he was younger. I didn't know him as a stutterer. I knew him as somebody who was very proud, somebody who actually became a dentist and went around the world, taught himself seven languages, even though he was deaf in one ear. And he was able to um, go around the world and speak about dentistry in foreign countries. And it would blow me away. I got to see him do this. It was pretty incredible. He had 180 awards for doing this. But I found out that when he was younger, he was a twin. I didn't know that until I was eight. My parents didn't tell a lot of private stories for some reason in our family. And um, what I found out is that he was a twin. His sister passed away when she was five and a half. And my father wasn't emotionally connected to my family very well because my grandmother told him, I want girls, not a boy, interestingly enough. Interestingly enough, she ended up with four boys. <laughs> <laughs> so my father went through school stuttering. He c couldn't talk very well, and therefore he couldn't connect very well, and he didn't have a voice. But there was a teacher who adopted him, and she said, I want to make you the star of a play. And he said, I c can't. And she said, no, let me do this. Let me help you. And if any of you have seen the King's speech, you'll know a little bit about what my father went through. And in a short amount of time, my father became the lead in a play, and my father stood up in front of everyone, and my father didn't stutter. And so he went on to school to study. He became the head of the debating team. He became the valedictorian of his class. And I wanted to know at the age of 14, what was that conversation all about that my father's life was changed so dramatically that he became the man he did? And so I wanted to help people around the world find their voice, in essence. I wanted it, whether it's men or women, people to learn how to have an ability to speak up about what's important to them and to have their dreams and aspirations come true. And that launched the work that I've been doing for 40 or plus years. So that's one story. Now I'd like you to hold that story in your mind. And then here's the other story. And this is a story that was done about gender. And it was a story about monkeys. And in this research project, they had a little boy monkey and a little girl monkey. And they put them in a room to play. And they had toys. And they had boy toys and girl toys. And then they had a uh, plexiglass window, and behind the window were the psychologists watching what was going on. And they had the toys out, they let the monkeys play, and they watched that the little boy monkey went over to play with the boy toys, and the little girl monkey went to play with the dolls. Interestingly enough, even in monkeys, there's a gender-specific choice about what they want to play with. Then they did the real experiment. When the boys were playing with the toys, they took away the toy from the monkey, the boy monkey, and they watched what the boy monkey did. Can anybody guess what the boy monkey did when his toy was taken away? Huh? The boy? Uh, take the girl, I hear, take the girl's toy. <laughs> Pouting is another answer. What's another answer? You're allowed to use anything you know about gender now. Hmm? Went, played with the girl's toys, possibly. Got angry, yes? They hit the person taking the toy. Now we're getting hotter into what happened exactly. What? <laughs> they weren't very nice about what they did. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but there is something about testosterone that men have higher than women. And what the boy monkey did is he ran over to the plexiglass where the consultant was holding the toy and started to bang and bang and bang on it and make <laughs> sounds. <laughs> and so he clearly went after what he wanted. And he clearly didn't care about fighting. He was going to get it back. Okay. Part one. Part two, same thing with little girls playing with their dolls, took the doll away, went behind the plexiglass, everybody could see. What do you think the girl did? The little girl monkey did. She cried. Sat cried, in the cried, sat in the corner, pouted, and so forth. The little girl monkey raises her hands and starts to cry. Now this is hardwired 
in men, male monkeys and female monkeys. And it has something to do with part of this story that we're going to unfold today about gender differences. So I'd like you to turn to your partner, or a couple people, even threes, and say, is there any connection between the first story and the second story? Or does it pop any interest that you might have or question you might want to answer today? You have three to four minutes to talk to partners. You could do it in threes. Listen to connect to each other while you're talking. Did anybody come up with a question that came out of the conversation um, that you want to make sure we address today or an insight you'd like to share? It could either be a question or an insight. Anybody come up with something? It started to raise your curiosity? Anybody? How many of you have ever done that where you've aspired to be something and as you think about yourself and you imagine yourself being that something and you begin to step in it in your mind, as you step into it in your mind, it begins to activate that part of you that has the capability to do this. And so frequently when people get upset at themselves, they kind of yell at themselves in your mind. I'm sure you've done that where you say, oh, that was so horrible. Oh, I can't believe I said that. How many of you have ever said that once in your life? Right, okay. That reinforces what you just did instead of freeing yourself to think about what you could do. So one, I'm going to be giving you tips throughout the session. And so as you begin to think about what's the person that I want to be, what are the aspirations, how do I see myself in the future, as you begin to do that, your brain actually opens up space in your brain where you begin to see yourself like that. And as that space grows, and you start to, by the way, then focus on people that have those skills that you want. How many of you would do that as well? You start to track people. We all do that in our lives. We say, oh, well, that's somebody I could model myself after. Oh, I see somebody doing it the way I'd like to do it. Yes, capture those moments and add them together. And you're going to begin to see yourself stepping into doing that better than you ever envisioned. Do you know that there are people that, we found this with piano players. How many of you are a piano player or any kind of musical instrument player? That if you don't play the piano for a period of time, but you envision yourself in your mind playing the piano, do you know that you can sit down at the piano and play almost as good or better than you did when you weren't playing? Now, I'm not encouraging you that to do that. What, what is that little laugh? What's that all about? <laughs> oh, now I don't have to practice as hard. Right. <laughs> Golf? <laughs> no. <laughs> golf? Absolutely. Yes. Who is the golf player? There was a whole book written about this, which is all about envisioning the, the golf swing and so forth. Yes, that, that we train our body through our mind. We train our words through our mind. And so envisioning it, if we can envision it, we can become it. We're going to spend a little time today on what's hardwired and softwired, and I'm going to show you some slides about um, things that people believe and neuroscientists believe are men's attributes and women's, and I'd like to see if this is true in your world. Um, we're going to talk also about some of the science that I have been um, talking about and how the wisdom of neuroscience enables us to move forward and have a breakthrough through the gender differences. And then we're also going to talk about what is it, that the strategies that you need for success. So we're going to go until about 5 o'clock. I understand that your CEO might visit us at 5. Is that correct? So we'll take a quick break then, and then we'll continue to work on this. The work that we're talking about, a lot of this is uh, in, and by the way, this is my seventh book. And this is the one that I've been trying to write since I was 14 years old. All the others were a part of the story. Uh, I, it was rejected at least 20 times. Um, part of what we find in genders is in order for women to move into the world they want to be in, they have to learn how to ha raise the courage that they have to speak up and push back. Men have to do the same thing. For some reason, because of your testosterone, guys, you have a stronger ability to step into that ring and go after the goal that you want. And so now we want to talk about how do women do that. You don't need testosterone in order to achieve your goals. You need to have focus. You need to have intention. You need to picture yourself in a world where you are equal to others and then step into that. Conversational intelligence is a hardwired and learnable ability for all of us, all human beings, to connect, to navigate and grow with others. It's a necessity in building healthier, more resilient organizations in the face of change. And what we've learned that's so important that I hope you'll take away from the session is that conversational intelligence and your ability to achieve your goals actually begins with elevating the level of trust that you create in the relationships with others. Because now we know that when we are in high trust with others, it frees our voice to be heard. And I want you to begin to think about the connection between trust and having a voice. Because what we're learning, I think, will astound you. And I'll give you a pre I'll, I'll, I'll preview it now so that you know how important this in is, is. It turns out 
the distrust lives in our lower brain, and that's where we get frightened and fearful. And so when we are frightened and fearful, we lose our voice. All the blood goes back from our brain into the lower part of our brain called the amygdala. We get hijacked. And it closes down everything else in our brain, which is where our voice lives, the ability to articulate what's important to us. However, trust lives in this part of the brain and the heart connection. And when we're able to activate this part of our brain, and we're going to talk about how to prime your environment for greater trust so that your voice is present more often when you need it. Does that make sense? Okay. And so when the prefrontal cortex is opened up and you're priming your environment for trust, then all of a sudden your ability to speak comes out. All of a sudden your ability to express your voice comes out. And you don't have to move to the aggressive behaviors that you were talking about, but you're able to articulate. Somehow it's all coming to you. It turns out that to get to the next level of greatness, whether you're in a company, in a team, a culture, it depends on the quality of the culture, which depends on the quality of relationships, which depends on the quality of conversations. Where people used to study culture first, I'm flipping things around and saying, if you study conversations first, conversation is what shapes the culture. And so as we begin to open the space for better conversations, we're able to open up the space for a better culture. Everything happens through conversation. This is what your brain looks like. I'd like you to um, hold your hand out, put your thumb in the middle so that you can take this picture away with you and show it to everybody back home, okay? Your thumb are your emotions, and that's hidden inside of this part of the brain. Okay, everybody got it? Your lower brain, this is where the amygdala is. This is the part that reacts and, when, and goes into protect behavior. Anytime people throw out words in a conversation to you that make you feel startled for any reason, this part of the brain sends a signal to you and all of a sudden, it sends this neurochemistry that closes down the rest of your brain. And this is low. It goes below the surface. It's not even something you think about. It happens by feeling it. How many of you ever, when you're talking to somebody, feel these nonverbal cues as well as verbal cues? How many people pick up the nonverbal? It turns out that the nonverbal cues are 73% of what's impacting you in the moment. It also is that those nonverbal cues operate in a 0 0.07 seconds that fast. So before a person even opens up their mouth to speak to you, you're beginning to feel the neurochemistry from the lower brain and it begins to activate. So what does that all mean? It means that um, we have an intention to have conversations with people, but as we're picking up all these signals, something happens. We're becoming aware that there's a lot more going on. And so sometimes the impact of what we're saying isn't what we intended. And as we begin to understand how the brain works and about the kind of rituals that we can go into with each other, we start to create the ability to connect more effectively with others, to build greater levels of trust, and to all of a sudden open up our brains to begin to see what are these dynamics that are taking place so we can have an influence. So part of what we're going to do is talk about how do we activate these new insights in our brain. First, I want to talk about men and women and what are the believed differences between genders to see if in fact this aligns with your thinking or not and whether it is true we have men and women in the room so I'm going to ask you to turn to your partner after I show the slide and talk about how true this slide is okay men's thinking binocular vision they focus on the destination men are much more systematized and compartmentalized they can isolate problems take action great at short-term focus so that they can move things forward phenomenal at winning take more risks and are much more externalized. And guys, by the way, do you somehow know how to navigate without a map? Is that, I mean, is that really, I want to know, I mean, is that most of you that are able to do that? Yes? <laughs> how does that happen, right? There's something in your brain that's doing that, right? <laughs> Women, on the other hand, it's believed, and some of this is, we're going to talk about the science behind this, uh, kaleidoscopic thinking, focusing about going on the journey. Women's brains connect a lot of dots. They see patterns. They can multitask many times um, more than men can. Uh, they can um, look at possible solutions before deciding about them and hold them in their brain. Um, they can handle a lot of things long term um, and they love being on a team and want more certainty than men and they personalize things. So if something's wrong, it's me that the problem is. Okay, I'd like you to turn to your partners and you can do three if not more and talk about do you think that these are even true or are these stereotypes? <laughs> How 
how many of you saw yourselves in, if you're a woman, saw yourself in the characteristics for women? How many women saw yourselves that way? Some. Some. And how many women saw yourselves on both sides? Yeah. More on both sides. Yeah. How about men? Did you see yourselves on the male side? Yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I, absolutely. Exactly, like 100%. This is exact. People can know you by this list. You send it out to everybody in your email, say, this is me, right? <laughs> well, what we're learning now is that while these are the, some of the stereotypes, and yes, there's certain things that relate to men and women, we now know that over 25% of men's brains are more like women, and 25% of women's brains are more like men. And the more we are integrating and talking to each other and learning how to learn each other's skill sets, the more we're actually changing our brains to operate differently so that the gender differences are not there. For example, this suggests that women pay more attention to connecting all the dots, to thinking about the journey so that you want to stop at all these places and figure it out, and maybe spend more time talking. But how many of you as women have also learned how to get to the destination, pick out your goals, you're executive women, correct? And you learn how to do it. So what we're now learning is that once we know the differences in the genders, and we say, how do we transfer those gender skills across both men and women? You're creating a much more healthy woman and a much more healthy man, because we need both. We need both. And not to let ourselves get caught in one or the other, because in fact, the stereotypes are part of what's causing all the problems. What's also interesting about what men's brains and women's brains look like, this is Dr. Amen, Daniel Amen, and he suggested, there's somebody who shaked, do you know this picture? Yes? <laughs> you understand about this. This says that um, what's different anatomically about men and, and women's brains are that we have a corpus callosum down the middle and we have the left and right side. Women have more fibers that cross between the two sides, which gives them more ability to make more connections between the two sides. And this is true. This probably won't change anatomically over the next 100 years. But what can change is your ability to adopt the skill sets that you haven't been using as much or use those muscles so that you have both the ability to focus on the destination and focus on how to get there. And both of those skills together are executive skill sets that everybody needs to have. And so I'd put that on your list of, of ed how to educate yourself. So you have a question. So like when, um, when people have damage in one side of their brain, they train the other side of their brain to sort of fill out the gaps. It's sort of the same. Exactly, idea. exactly, exactly. That what I talk about are conversational rituals. The ritual, for example, of talking about destinations first is a conversational ritual. I want you to know it's not necessarily just hardwired in the brain. And yes, if something happens on one side, there is a belief that every cell holds the wisdom of every other cell. And so if one side is damaged, it's very possible that the other side then can get activated because it holds that memory. Our brains are in the capacity of the brain is extraordinary. I mean, if you can imagine each cell somehow can have the memory of the hologram of the whole. It's, it's quite extraordinary. So these are the things that we're learning about the brain that we never knew before. It's absolutely astounding. But this shows that the woman's brain has a lot more going on and there's a lot more crisscross. That we know is the case. And for some reason, we now believe that men's brains are heavier. <laughs> Guys, what's going on in there? <laughs> Tell me it's the big ideas, right? <laughs> But when it comes to ex executive development and executive leadership, you can learn each other's skill sets. This is part of what I hope the breakthrough is for all of us in our lives right now, that those are skills, those are conversational rituals that you can practice. You can't change the fact that you have women more testosterone unless you get some shots of testosterone and, and be more aggressive and men maybe not having the estrogen. But these are the practices, everyday conversational practices that equip you to be a broader, better thinker. Okay? When we do this, we find out that something fascinating happens, that there is a huge, um, huge amount of neur uh, neuronal connections from the heart to the brain. The more we learn how to speak each other's language, the more our heart gets into sync with each other. This is male or female. The more that happens, the more our brain opens up. This is a takeaway that I want you to focus on. So if you say, like, what's important for me to practice when I leave here? It's that listening to connect that we started to talk about. That because even though you have differences in many things in our lives, when you meet people from foreign countries, we have differences. But listening to connect rather than reject is one thing that activates this heart-brain connection and opens up the prefrontal cortex. When it does, the heart has more complex neur neuron systems, nervous system called the heart-brain. The heart sends more information from the brain 
this lower brain, the heart brain, to the rest of the um, brain. And it signals the brain's centers for decision making, creativity, and emotional experience. So imagine that the more that we learn how to have conversations that bridge the genders, the more our brain automatically starts to open up, the more our heart goes into a coherent beat, and the more our conversations are more fruitful because we're opening up this part of the brain where strategic thinking, empathy, stepping into somebody else's shoes. How many of you have heard of mirror neurons? If you haven't, for those who haven't, I'd love you to check this out. Mirror neurons are, were discovered at the end of the uh, 1900s, 1999, in, um, in Italy, Parva, Italy. And there, uh, for some reason, everybody starts on monkeys before they go to humans. So this was another monkey experiment. They had two monkeys in a cage. One monkey had a cup of coffee. And, the, and they put the fMRI machine, where these are the electrodes where you can see what's going on in the brain, on both of them. And as one monkey picked up his cup, and his brain was activating for him to do that, the other monkey started to have activations in the same part of the brain. And they thought, my goodness, what's going on here? Nothing was happening. And the doctor realized that he was watching the other monkey and mirroring that monkey inside of his own brain. In the same way my father mirrored the actor, in the same way that human beings get to know each other really well, when we open up the mirror neurons in our brain and stop judging people for who they are, but getting to know them and asking questions for which we don't have answers, then these mirror neurons activate. And believe it or not, they are big. They're bigger than just the normal neurons because they have filters that go down into the gut. And we believe that when people connect in that way, that they start to activate their gut instinct to connect with other human beings. That is the most important activity that human beings can do today. When that happens, not only do you begin to step inside somebody else's world and begin to understand their world differently, but it opens up your capacity to use all of the other things that are in this part of the brain because you're not frightened. You're now trusting that that person won't harm you. And so strategic thinking, being able to handle gaps. This, these are all the executive skills that you need to have every day. Being able to understand another person, asking more questions instead of saying, yeah, I know what the answer is. You, I know what you're going to say. We all go there. That's addicted to being right. But by making that connection, and it's not a male or female skill set, it's a human skill set. This is what we need to do to break through the gender differences and begin to learn how to connect with others. Make sense? I want you to take a second and say, I think I have a picture actually of the brain's yeah, incoherence. You can't see this a lot, but what you need to know is at Princeton University, neuroscientists um, are studying language, conversation, and how people sync. And when they put the fMRI on, what they noticed is that person one and person two's brain started to have the same activity. And when that happened, they started to see the world the same way. And when that happened, their ability to bridge reality came together and they started to see one shared reality. So imagine, talk about this with your partners. What would happen if all of you were able to activate those mirror neurons in each other? What kind of impact that might that have on your business world today? Talk about that with your couple partners. What might be the impact? What would happen if this were, if everybody learned these skills? What, what might change? And maybe there's a different way that you phrased it in your little teams. What might happen? What, what did you see in the vision of your foresight? World what? peace. World, <laughs> world peace. <laughs> exactly. World peace, yeah. Agreed, but it also sounded like the opposite of diversity because it sounds, it sounds like everyone would be thinking in the same way and being completely agreeable whereas, as opposed to having different thoughts and different approaches and other possibilities around that. Right, so the question is if we use this thinking to connect with others and to gain empathy and to really step inside of them and their world, does that also mean, raises the question, does that also mean that we give up our own unique thinking? Do we live in groupthink? Do we, in fact, um, give up our identity? Do, is diversity being uh, exchanged for something that seems like uh, the 60s cool and hip and we're all connected? Did I say that sort of right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about that? Interestingly enough, I'll share with you new research that came out yesterday on the web actually raised that question. Yeah, yeah. So, so we need a we, we need to connect, and at the same time, we need to be able to hold on to our individual identity. Correct? The question is, what's, what's all this mean, right? What, is, what does all this mean for us? Okay, other questions? Yes, please. Well, along those lines, uh, you know, we talked about trust, right? Yeah. So it's, it's very difficult to be on the same page if there's a lack of trust. 
Right. So you know when you, you start a dialogue with a you know a prospect or a client or uh, you know someone even internally, it's okay. What are they after? You know mm -hmm. the other person trying to figure that out. Right. And so there's this trust factor. We right. talk about that all the time. Yep. And so what we're learning the most important thing in in the trust factor is to have intentions become transparent. If your intentions are not transparent with someone else, you're meeting with your customers and your clients, uh, the question is, am I here to lose and are they here to win? Is this going to be a battle? Are they trying to persuade me? Am I going to end up with less? And so one of the most important things, if you want to have a takeaway for what you can do starting tomorrow in relationships that are important, that have high stake and are critical for you, is begin to think about what is your intention in that relationship and how can you share that with the other person in order to quell the part of their brain that activates the amygdala. Because once that activates, people will go into fight more often or flee more often, meaning they're not going to share what's really important on their mind, um, or they just won't speak up. And so part of what we're going to talk about is how do you prime the brain to create the environment of trust so that regardless whether it's a male or a female, you can open up the space for the most important conversations that you ha need to have with people. And it's not the conversations that you end up having with a stranger because you're upset and you go home and yell at your dog and your parents <laughs> and your friends, but it's the conversation that you can have with, with somebody else. Let's take a look about what I call brain cocktails because that's a piece of the story we started to talk about it a little bit. Brain cocktails are what gets stirred up. Um, when people come into a meeting, and they're ready to fight. You described the relationship of sometimes what happens when you're with customers. Where does that put you? If you could read the tea leaves every time you see that behavior, what's the outcome of that conversation? Usually. It, it's not fruitful to either side. Right. And so it's what we call level two conversations are positional conversations where somebody comes into a conversation with a position or a point of view and their desire is to win. Okay. And so they will. Um, use arguments, they'll listen to influence in a direction that they want, and they're not open for influence. Right? So the question is, how do we change the environment, the conversational environment? Because those type of brain cocktails um, are things that get, get us triggered before we even start. Um, it's why we lose our voice. It's when we start to pick up all the nonverbals that are telling us that something's not going very well. It's when we start to read the, the body language, and now we're really convinced that these people aren't on our side. And are there alternatives to push just to push back and give back as hard as they're doing, what are the alternatives that enable us to prime the conversation and to change the dynamic of that conversation in order to create a connect? I'd like you to, to this is one more conversation before your CEO comes in. You're all smart, you've all been in conversations where partnering with others is critical. I want you to think about one time when you've been successful in any kind of conversation in your life where you've be able, been able to take a divergent point of view where people weren't on the same page and what did, you, what did your instincts tell you you could do to shift that conversation? In other words, what was one of your best conversations where you went from distance to, yes? I worked with a woman who, she was a very difficult woman and she was ready for a fight with everybody who approached her, and this is a few years ago now. Um, we were ordered to go out and sit down and figure it out or we would be out of jobs. Mm -hmm. And I had to get her out from behind a desk, so I invited her to lunch, and she sat there frozen, holding her arms and together. And I said, why don't you tell me what your problem is with me? Mm -hmm. And she did, and I said, oh my god, that's my problem with you. I tried to confront her in a non-confrontational way, I guess. Well, you use two of the things that are important, and I'm going to, if again, a, a word that I want you to take away is called priming. So what you did is the, the whole situation got changed, and the brain cocktails got changed because of some, two things. One is when we ask people to take a break from the moment and go away and think about it, which is what, it's called disengaging. It enables your brain to disengage from the cocktail dynamics that you're in at the moment and to actually step away and get refreshed. How many of you have ever done that, where you've literally disengaged, you've walked away, you've thought about it? And if you haven't, and if there aren't, that's okay if you haven't. I'd love you to consider asking people, but let's just take a minute, because actually what it sends is a signal, again, 90, 3% of it are the signals we send each other. It says, I respect this relationship enough to want to take a break to think about it. How important is that, right? I don't want to just split and it's over. And number two, think about being transparent. That's what we talked about before. Transparent with where you are in the moment. When we tell each other where we stand with each other, even if where we stand doesn't feel good, labeling where we stand creates oxytocin to be produced between two people. You have to get what this is all about. This is a brain cocktail. 
When I make you feel better because I let you know where you stand so you don't have to make it up, my brain will produce oxytocin. Oxytocin is bonding. It creates bonding in our bodies. It literally created what you got, which was, oh my God, that's the same thing for me. And all of a sudden now you're connecting as real human beings about where you stand. Kind of an amazing thing. Yeah. So sharing your intentions. It's sharing instead of withholding, being honest about where you're coming from, helps another person get what's going to happen, you know, how to identify you. Are you a threat or are you going to be a friend? Are you a foe or are you a friend? Until we know that, we're not going to have a good conversation with anybody. Okay, so that's number one, so that's T. R is relationship. Focusing on the relationship and saying, I want to in some way help build a stronger relationship with you. That's what you did with this person. You sat down and said, I want to talk about us, as opposed to the job, the task, the decision we have to make. Again, our brain needs that. Every time you do that, it moves you up one level higher in being able to open up your brain to have a better conversation. And the last thing that you said you did was the understanding. I just want to sit here and talk about this. Let's figure out more about each other's perspectives. We're not making a decision. We're staying open. What you're doing is opening up the brain to have a different kind of dialogue. I guarantee you those three things, if you go no further in the trust model than just those three things, can radically change how you prime conversations for greater connectivity, for greater trust, and greater understanding. We had a great conversation, and I want to remember you, but we're going to remember anybody, good or bad. The reason is, for in our brain, there's a place we've called a spot for that person to live inside of us. Every time I meet you, I add another detail to that spot. So the next time I meet you, we don't think of all the details. Let's say we had 10 great times together and too bad, but because there's 10 great, the balance goes in the great, I probably give you a halo, how many of you have given a halo to somebody when you have a lot of good experiences? Yeah, the husband that when you first met him, you thought, oh my God, I met the perfect man, and then all of a sudden he becomes real. And the woman who you married who all of a sudden becomes real in front of your very eyes. But that's how the brain works. And so we have a higher level of adrenaline, thinking about it. You've had that happen, right? You start to think before you come in the room. Or if it's not a good relationship, you start to get the apprehension that pulls us back. By neutralizing it the way you do, you start it clean. You don't activate all of those memories and the opportunity for new thinking emerges. Just like with my father and his identity, it gives you a chance to redefine that relationship. Powerful, really powerful. When we label something that is emotionally difficult for us at the time or a difficult situation, but we put a label on it in a nice package, it actually, for the person, makes them conscious or self-aware. For us, it actually down-regulates. One of the questions you asked me is, what, how does this work relate to emotional intelligence? By labeling words and giving them a meaning that is <coughs> neutral enough, not judgmental, calling it out as it is, so to speak, then it activates the ability of the prefrontal cortex to downregulate those behaviors. That's what this brain is designed for. It's downregulation as well as all the other things. And so it's just a natural course of events. What we tend to do, how many of you have found that you have a little bit of a conflict aversion about speaking up, saying difficult things, or you know, calling things out? All of us have a little bit of that, right? We call it the elephants in the room syndrome. And so it's, it's ta everybody talks this way. However, if we can learn, again, to call something out and give a label to it in a context, in setting it in the context of, boy, it would be so great if we could have a, you know, the room quiet up so that we could hear each other, your voice is a little high, that labeling something and calling it out gets us through our conflict aversion because you'll start to see it instantly has an impact in the room. It instantly has an impact, and a positive one, I'm sure you've used that many times. Have you ever tried that we want to work with you strategy? Well, I don't know that anybody's ever opened up to him because they're all afraid know. of his, you know, um, animosity. And, 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 and he's difficult. And he's a client? Yeah. Mm. Is he doing? Not anymore. Not, <laughs> I was going to say, right, right. Sometimes we fire our clients. Yeah, I'm serious. But I mean, I, I'm such an advocate of sitting down and facing the truth with people because probably people have been so frightened to even say anything to him that it continues to get worse and worse because we get better at whatever we do and if what we're doing is bad, we'll just get better at being bad, right? So, I mean, I love to ask people and to challenge each other to, when that kind of thing happens, to be willing to stand up and just have a talk and say, listen, things aren't working out very well. Many leaders don't get to get the feedback and we've done so many assessments where we'll ask a leader to assess your organization and how it's doing and then all the other people to assess it and we line them up. We have a spider web that you can see the difference and the CEOs usually give a halo much more than a lot of employees because people are afraid to speak up. And part of what I hope that this work encourages people to do is to learn that it becomes more harmful when we, do, harmful when we don't speak up than when we do speak up. 
and that that person could benefit dramatically and might even have some of the biggest insights in their whole life if somebody were to sit down in a friendly way and say, God, I'd love to work with you, but I can't. This is what's making it really difficult. Have you ever worked through this before with your clients? I mean, it sounds funny, but that kind of honesty is what can transform a human being. Hearing that for the first time is, is dramatic. So I think a lot of women in the room may kind of nod heads. I don't know if men will agree with this, but often when you're in um, a meeting and you're, let's just say, butting heads or you're disagreeing, when you walk out of that meeting, the guys are like, hey, we still have a four o'clock tea time tomorrow. And the women are like, oh my God, he's out to get me. He does that to me every time. And for the next six hours, you just sit there stewing about it and you don't let it go. So how do, I mean, do we agree on that? <laughs> not um, how do we as women learn to let that go? How do we learn to be more like men in that case? Well, I'm going to ask the men in the room. You've been just described as you can do be butt headers. Is that I mean head butters? <laughs> what do they call that? A Freudian slip? <laughs> and and is this is this the fun and play that you that you have with each other? And it means nothing. It's just fun and play. You're just batting ideas around. What I want to hear from a man in the room who can put context around that. Let me hear something. John? What? <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about why do women personalize so many but, things and, 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 and why that creates awkwardness right. in certain conversations, or at least could. And then somebody said it's because women are hardwired that way, you more on it. Some women are hardwired that way, not everybody's way. Right, 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 right. It's hard to tell. So women, when you're doing ideas, but the ideas aren't you. They're not you. They're not, e they're not people. They're just ideas. And women take them personally like they're my idea. And you're feeling ripped apart. I mean, my goodness, look, they've been fighting and they like each other after this. My goodness, what do you have to eat to make that happen? You know? <laughs> to answer your question, if a guy wanted to make it personal, a guy would know how to make it personal yeah. right away. So you've all been <laughs> saved from something. In other words, this is good behavior. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the takeaway? What should, if you were giving advice, you're a coach, to women, what would you tell them to get out, how to get over it? Oh, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> to pick on for a while though. <laughs> Who has advice about for women to women? How do you get through those kind of conversations? Yes. Well, I think when, when you were talking, it seemed to me that maybe because men are more sports or oriented or they're, they're used to sort of that combat type thing and then they can shake hands and go away and I don't know if women have the same feeling. Yeah. That's just what, what you said maybe. So what the neuroscience says about that is that when men go into that kind of butt-heading and head-butting, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that actually they are getting jolts of adrenaline, first of all, which makes you get stronger because you love to do it. It is a sports thing. It's sport for them, right? They feel good. It's, being, it's part of the reward system. If you do it, it's back and it's like, okay, we're getting stronger. Our muscles are getting, you're in the ring together, and that feels really good. So for them, they're getting a reward system that feels wonderful. For women, you're getting a completely different system. It's not the reward system. It's the fright system. Oh my God, somebody's going to lose their head. Somebody's going to lose their job. Whatever we come away with, our brain goes into a different story. And that's part of the difference. That's where the hard wiring does not make a difference. And you start to vent with a lot of people about it and keep talking about how horrible that experience was and how bad that person was. Now you've stirred up much more than 26 hours and it keeps going. Yes. We discussed something in our phone call with you, and, and it had to do with how do you walk away from something feeling that you gained respect, mm -hmm. and maybe that's part of it. How do we walk out, instead of holding something, feeling that at least we felt comfortable, at least we felt respected, right? and that you know what we're saying is worth something to the other party? So you have two things that you have to work on. One is reframing the situation in your own mind, and the other is reframing the situation in the mind of the person that you're having the conversation with because the cat fighting approach doesn't work for anybody. And if you can step back and say, so reframing is, the, is what I call conversational agility. It's the ability to take a situation that has a lot of emotion in it, stand back and have what's called the third eye, which is the picture I showed earlier, and say, if I were observing the situation, how would I frame it up that would lead to a better outcome for both people? So what would shared success look like in that relationship? So we go back to shared success. And then how can I go back to that person and talk about that situation in terms of shared success instead of getting caught in the emotion? Because in the emotion, you're not having a conversation that sets the context for change. You're stirring up the emotion and having 26 more hours again of this emotion. So reframing, 
is one of the most important skill sets that human beings can use when you're learning conversational intelligence. You don't need to live in the situation as you've described it. You can take another story and build another story around it and saying, this one situation was really tough for both of us. I know how important it is to be at the level we are in an organization and to work on something and have it not work out the way we want. I'd really like to spend some time with you revisiting what good or great would look like for us. We don't have to keep working it this way. Between the two of us, we can begin to invent together another way that's going to work better. Those words actually, again, go back to opening up the prefrontal cortex because those are the words that that part of the brain loves to hear. It loves to hear, I can change it, I can do something, I have courage, and we're going to do it together. This is the we part of the brain. And when we're in those kind of arguments and the cat fights, we're in the I part of the brain trying to win. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and, and how many of you talk to yourself? Come on, how many of you, I mean, is there anybody that doesn't? You are your best friend most of the time. Sometimes you beat yourself up, or that little voice of your parent comes back and beats you up if you don't do it, right? <laughs> but it's, it's really beginning to say, how do I see a better way, and how do I have the courage to present that to my partner and see if they'll join me with it? And more often than not, <coughs> it does re show respect for people, and it does really begin to create an environment where people can try to think about working it out. You may not have the answer right away. Somebody else was talking about you may not have the answer right away. That was your story, right? But it comes to you because that's what this brain is designed to do. That's what I love about this work. work. We have that capacity. We just have to create the conditions for that capacity to come out. Okay. Yes? In the scenario you described, I was imagining a different answer. Great. Come. In the scenario that you described, after the disagreement, uh, the male side of the pair said, you know, is there tea time still on? and the woman walked away and stewed. So what I heard from the male side is that they went to a neutral territory and reinforced the relationship. Mm -hmm. And that the woman went back to the office and went home and stewed. And remembered So it. rather than reframing it, mm -hmm. which is a little bit of taking the responsibility on yourself and saying, I've got to fix this, maybe it is sometimes looking at that relationship and going to that neutral ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a problem with a particular market at one point. Whatever I said, this person just flew off the handle. And I asked other people, is it just me? Or is she like this with everyone? And, and they said, just go out for a drink with this person and sit down and talk to them and you know, develop a personal relationship and all of this friction will go away. And it actually, it ended up being the case. So. Sometimes I think we don't have those contacts, or we don't build them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I heard the scenario, I thought there was a very different uh, path to success. The, be the beautiful thing about this is that there, are more, there is more than one path to success. And I constantly go back to the choices that I have in front of me. One is going back to building relationship, which is where you started. You know, saying, let's sit down and just have a drink. Being transparent, let's work on a relationship. Let's just have fun together. You don't even have to work on it. You can just do it, right? And the other is if you think that a context needs to be shifted, that you have the courage to shift the context. And boy, either of those. That's what I love about this work. We have in our hands the ability to make change in our relationships in such rich ways without it being as complex and without walking away from the relationship. Great, great suggestions. Other things that, questions? Yes, please. wanted to get your advice actually on something. I'm a young female professional and I find that I will sometimes uh, lose my voice in a situation where I'm the youngest one in the room or the youngest woman in a room. Um, I find uh, that maybe young men, maybe they have it a little bit, but I find that maybe females do have it a little more because we're females as well. Do you have any advice as to how to get over that? and get past that, embrace our ages, and get more confidence? I'm going to turn around. I have lots of responses to that. I'm going to turn around and say, for those of you, anyone in the room, who remembers what it was like when you started out and you didn't have your voice, what was the one step that you took in order to, to get your voice? Is there anybody in the room that remembers that? Please. I read everything. I made sure that I knew, because most people don't read. Mm -hmm. And so if I read policies and I knew that I knew, and then I just made sure I had something to say, something to add. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Anybody else? I hear another, I see another hand. Yeah, I think um, being I'm much, much older than you are, mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the critical thing which I remember and I told early on uh, when I was in the room that you're in the room because you're valued to be part of the room. And when you're in the room, you have the obligation to be, to, to make your voice heard. Um, 
I, you know, early in my career, I, I was, got fired from a job because I did not uh, correct the comment our chairman had made while I was prepping him for an analyst meeting. Mm -hmm. He thought it was a trend line. I was embarrassed to tell the chairman of our company that was a linear regression curve, and I almost got fired because they told my boss when they left the room, just so you know, he's like, you were there, you didn't use your voice. I think confidence is a big one. I had somebody tell me once that you're sitting in that meeting, you know this account better than anybody else knows this account. Can you hear? To go in and understand that. And, and just practice speaking. I'm hearing a lot of people saying something that I hope you heard in different forms, which is your age doesn't matter. Interestingly enough, at Nike, they do something that simulates what I'm going to suggest that you think about for yourself, which is that they take people that have been in a certain role for a long time, they take them out of that role, and they intentionally put them into a role where they've never done anything before like that, and they do it for two reasons. The most important for you to hear is they do it because people that come in fresh and young with new ideas see the world differently. And that's why people want you there. And so if you go in with that mindset, everything will change in front of your eyes. And out of all of this, what I hope you'll also take away is that it's so important to have coaches. It's so important to have mentors. It's so important to have sponsors. It's so important to have people to talk to, to play out ideas, so that every time you go in that room, you've primed yourself now to feel really good about and feeling really a big part of what's happening in the room. So you don't feel that distance, but you feel really connected. It's awesome. Other other questions that you absolutely, absolutely felt like you wanted to have answered to become more effective and successful, please. Using conversational intelligence, how do we as a gender um, use it to bridge the gender pay gap that still exists today? Mm -hmm. Meaning that? Meaning we're still getting 80 cents for every dollar a man makes. And we should be at 100 and 100. So mm -hmm. I mean, what takeaways can we, can we take from this? to our normal business life to apply when we ever have to go back, back for a promotion or something to us. Yeah, I, I think, and, and I'd love to hear from senior people in the room who know what's going on here at Willis in order to help change the, um, the dynamics around pay because that sits somewhere up here. However, I think I'm also hearing, and I'd love to be able to am amplify that if you're um, doing good work and you're doing great work and you want to get promoted and you're on that track to move up, that just because there's this, this ceiling, glass ceiling that's sitting out there, should not stop you from going in and talking with your bosses, getting as much help as you can to begin to move into other positions. Because a lot of times, it, apparently there's a lot of research that women leave before they make it to the top. More women pull out before they get a chance to question and challenge the glass ceiling and keep going up. And it's partially because um, we, they say, oh, you have, we have family, I have kids at home and I have to take care of them. But when we talk to them, it's not. It's about how hard it is to face what you're talking about, which is to really go in and step up and make a case for yourself and for why you're important to the organization. I think that still has to happen. It happens with men. It needs to happen with women. And the company has to start looking at what are the right things to do for men and women to equalize out the pay. So I think it's a double, double whammy. So the chart that you're seeing up here, um, it says trust changes reality, and above that it says resistor, skeptic, wait and see, experimenter, and co-creator. And what it means, um, and what I, I developed that years ago when I was working with a company in Hollywood, and I had 21 contentious people in the room not getting along and wanting to figure out how to get along. And, and I looked up and I said, God, I have no idea how to, to fix this. And somehow, as soon as I said the word God, all of a sudden a picture popped into my mind. I don't know how that works, but <laughs> this picture popped into my mind. And what, I, what it is is that we can live in resistor all our life and say it's not going to work and, it's, it's just, and be skeptical about it's not going to work. And that's a state of mind for human beings that we get into when things aren't working well. We can also say I'm going to live in this wait and see place where maybe somebody will come along and help me, maybe somebody will help me speak up, but I, I, I don't know where to go and I don't know how to go anywhere. But what I'm advocating in this um, chart, which became the conversational dashboard, and a gauge for how to move into better relationships with everyone, is to go into the experimenter place and say, and by the way, I spell experimenter as someone who's experimenting and mentoring, that I believe that we're living in a world of we right now. And the most important thing is to be able to play out. Your question is, how do I get in front of the curve and, and do something about that? If you play out with another person and let them hear how you're going to approach it, let them coach you for how you might try it differently, and then take that on as an experiment that you're going to try. Every time you do that and you have a win, which you will because you're getting great coaching and because you're trying things differently, that creates a new pathway in the brain. 
It creates a new pathway towards success more quickly. This is what all of us need to know. We can't get from here to there without trying new things. We can't get from here to there without making some mistakes. But the more that we try those experiments that test our ability to step into courage and to get the help of another person and reflecting back, this is how that made me feel. Is that what you wanted to accomplish? So intention and impact get hardwired more effectively in our brains. The more we're going to discover that we start to step up and into situations with greater success. That's how the brain works. That's what we need to start doing with our brain, is training our brain, interrupting those patterns, and being experimental, and then sharing the successes with those who have helped us come a long way from where we were. Thank you so much. It was a very informative discussion. You're welcome. Um, certainly, the ACE Women's Forum and the Women at Willis were both formed to encourage diversity of thought within our organizations and, uh, and also recognize some of the differences that are innate between uh, men and women and try to bridge the gap there a bit. So certainly you helped to further our mission today. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.